Good afternoon, church. I got it right that time. I've been saying good morning all day. What an honor and blessing it is to be able to worship our King today, Lord Jesus. And um, I just want to open a prayer again. I know we prayed a bit, but um, I never um, want to begin preaching without first coming before the Lord um, in humility. Father God, we praise you for this day. Father, we thank you that we can come before you, that we can lay our lives down each and every day to a holy, righteous, loving, kind God. Lord, I ask that you would be here now with me, that you would anoint me, that it would not be my words that are heard today, but it would be by your spirit and by your word. I pray, Lord, that we would have eyes and minds to receive your word, and that we would gain understanding today, all for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We're continuing our sermon series, um, Faith That Works, from the book of James. Brother Jonathan kicked us off last week as we looked at the first four verses within chapter one. And what a great word it was, that we are to live in constant joy, that we encounter trials with joy, and that we are to live in faith. We see in these four verses that trials produce within us patience and spiritual maturity. Before we jump into our text for today, I just want to pause momentarily and ask the question, how many here know of people who thought they were Christian, that would say, once I was a Christian, that is, they literally said, I was a Christian, but when faced with a struggle, when faced with hardship, they fold. They walk away. They can't handle the situation. And I just want to make it clear, loved ones, that is not faith. That is not what the Bible defines as faith. And James makes it very clear that genuine faith in God is able to withstand anything and everything this world can throw at it. James parallels and makes reference to the Sermon on the Mount over 15 times throughout these chapters. Some would say the book of James is like the New Testament Proverbs. It is soaked in instruction on godly living and obedience to God's word. And in many ways, sifts out those who are not truly living, faith-filled lives. And so he challenges those whom he is speaking to, and also his readers, also to us, to search within and gain understanding of what genuine faith looks like in the midst of difficulty and hardship. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to James chapter 1. We're looking at verses 5 through 12. It'll be up on the screen as well. And it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and let the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. We continue this week as we began last week, speaking of trials. Not if they will come, but when. As Christians, trials will come. As Christians, we don't get a pass. There are no Christian vouchers we get to simply avoid trials. And today we will gain an understanding from God's word, how we are to go through them. We cannot go around the church. We must go through them by the power of the Holy Spirit. Our sermon title today is Faithful, Humble, and Victorious Through Trials. We will look at three points today from God's Word on how we as Christians are to persevere through trials. So church, how are we to persevere through trials? Firstly, unwavering faith. Look again at verse 5 with me. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. 
but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. We see here wisdom is tied to faith and doubt is tied to instability. The first step in going through a trial is to have knowledge and godly understanding. We as believers need to have a very steeped and grounded amount of understanding when we are going through the challenges we face in life. And it is that need for knowledge and understanding in the midst of trials that should lead us to ask of God to supply that understanding and give us wisdom. Real faith, unwavering faith is not based on feelings. I'm sure everyone here can attest that our feelings will fail. They fail us over and over and over again. Genuine, genuine faith is based on knowledge and understanding of God's word, the promises of God's truth, which is spiritual wisdom. No matter the testing or trial, whether physical, emotional, moral, or spiritual, we as believers have a special need of God's wisdom. Job says in his final response to his friends that are attempting but failing miserably to counsel him, he says this, But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its worth, and it is not found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not with me, not in me. And the sea says, it is not with me. It cannot be bought for gold, and silver cannot be weighed as its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, in precious onyx or sapphire. Gold and glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of crystal. The price of wisdom is above pearls. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. From where then does wisdom come? And where is the place of understanding? It is, it is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Abandoned and death say, we have heard a rumor of it with our ears. God understands the way to it, and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he gave to the, when he gave the, to the wind its weight and apportioned the waters by measure, when he made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder, then he saw it and declared it. He established it and searched it out. And he said to man, behold, the fear of the Lord that is wisdom, and to turn away from evil is understanding. God alone is where wisdom is found, loved ones. And guess what? He says that if we just simply ask for it, he will give it to us. Generously and without reproach, it is God's loving desire to give us his divine wisdom and understanding. And oh, what a promise, church, that is from our God. Let him ask. Let him ask there in verse 5. It's an imperative verb when translated, meaning it is a divine command. We as believers are commanded to ask the Lord for wisdom. Failure to do so may result in our continued testing and trials, may even increasingly so. God may keep us in the thick of it until we bow to him and ask. He's not just going to lavish his wisdom on an unwilling heart and mind. The Lord is pleased to impart his wisdom to us. Amen. As he gives generously to all who ask of him without reproach, meaning he will not withhold even in the slightest, even in our pride. As we take our sweet time, and I'm guilty of this, over and over again to ask him. God knows the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, as we see in Mark 14, 38. Wisdom leads to genuine faith. James goes on to stress the importance of faith when asking of God. It needs to be the right kind of asking, in faith, without doubting, verse 6. Faith in God's character, his purpose, his truth, and his promises. 
The fact is, though many of us doubt, we don't truly be believe God will give us what we need. And we'll make all kinds of excuses as to why. All kinds. Maybe it's because we're undeserving, which, by the way, is 100% true, but irrelevant to those of us who are in Christ. Or maybe we think we're not worthy of God's attention. This is also true of a holy, righteous God. But out of God's endless grace and love, he chooses to take great interest in his children. Amen. Or we argue with God. How many are guilty of arguing with God? We get angry that we are even in a trial or a hard time. How could you allow this God? So we dispute him, wondering why there is no way out. A request that is doubting or does not take God at his word and doubts his ability to do anything or doubts his trustworthiness is worthless and an offense towards God. As we heard just last week from Brother Jonathan, as he quoted Hebrews 11.6, without faith it is impossible to please God. And then it goes on to say that he rewards those who seek him. James goes on in verse 6 that the Christian who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. This kind of request rooted in doubt is not really a request at all. It is extremely foolish because this person does not believe God will honor the request to begin with. This is an extremely immature person, like a child being tossed around by the waves. This foolishness can lead to all kinds of danger and deception. As Paul says in Ephesians 4.14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. James tells us that this person who doubts God should not expect to receive anything. Not receive anything from God. This double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We see these people throughout Scripture, from ancient Israel to Revelation, the Lord detests them. Those who are neither hot nor cold, the Lord says he will spit them out we see in Revelation 3.16. We are to seek the Lord in faith and ask of him to lead us in every way. Solomon says in Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. But in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Our Lord will not withhold anything to those who truly seek him. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. Listen to this, church. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And just look at this beautiful promise from our Lord Jesus, Matthew 7, 7 through 11. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, Give good things to those who ask him. Praise God. God longs to give good gifts to his children. His wisdom being one of the best. God's wisdom is one of the best to know him. But we cannot be double-minded. We cannot be riding the fence one foot in and one foot out. Ultimately, such a person is living in sin because you cannot love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and at the same time doubt him. It's impossible. Spurgeon in one of his sermons says this, Now if God hath gifts for all men, how much more will he have gifts for that man who earnestly turns his tearful eye to heaven and cries, My Father, give me wisdom that I may be reconciled to thee through the death of thy son. 
why the grass, as Herbert says, never asked for the dew, and yet every blade has its own drop. And shall you daily cry for the dew of grace, and there be no drop of heaven's grace for you? Impossible. Fancy your own child saying, my father, my father, I want to be obedient, I want to be holy, and suppose that you have power to make your child so, could you find it in your heart to refuse? No. It would be a greater joy to you to give than it could be to the child to accept. For application, loved ones, God longs to give the believer of genuine, unwavering faith good gifts, like his wisdom. We are commanded to ask the Lord for wisdom because it is in his wisdom he so graciously gives us that our faith is strengthened and it's what enables us to go through the testing of trials when we face them. But we cannot doubt. So it is imperative that we know our God. We must know him, his word, his truth, and his promises to those who seek him. How are we to persevere through trials, loved ones? By unwavering faith, found in God's wisdom. Secondly, a spirit of humility. Look at verses 9 through 11. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also the rich man fades away in the midst of his pursuits. A humble spirit is another necessity of the Christian in perseverance through trials. James speaks of the lowly brother, or the brother of humble circumstances, the economically poor saint. Most of those James is speaking to here have been scattered, as Brother Jonathan Pope, uh, let us know last week. And they fled persecution. They've had their homes and land confiscated, most likely being left financially poor, as they had to flee for, sa for, for safety. Despite these circumstances, James says this lowly brother or this believer who is poor has something to boast about. He is to boast or glory in his exaltation or high position. What is he saying here? James is saying even a Christian who is in desperate or dest in a destitute situation can have a sense of legitimate pride in his high position as a child of God. Just think of all the glorious blessings that brings. Children of God, co-heirs with Christ, salvation, eternal life, joy, eternal in God's glory. We may be, <laughs> church, we may be considered the scum of the earth in the eyes of this world, but in God's eyes, we are exalted because of Jesus. Let's look at it this way, loved ones. Are you hungry? You have the bread of life in Jesus. Are you thirsty? You have the living water in Jesus. Are you poor? You have eternal riches in heaven. Are you rejected by man? You are eternally, eternally received by the living God. No home on earth? Gloriously prepared place in heaven. Jesus says, I have gone to prepare a place for you. When God in his sovereignty and wisdom takes something away from us, it is to make us more spiritually mature, refining us, sanctifying us, perfecting us, and making us more dependent on him. A blessing worth so much more than anything we have here, anything that we've lost or have ever wanted to possess. The lowly brother is one who may be deprived here on earth, which is temporary, but looks to the incredible and divine inheritance to come, which is eternal and secure. Peter puts it this way, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. 
And John says in 1 John 3, 1 through 3, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is, and everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as he is pure. Praise God. Paul says in Romans 8, 16 through 18, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are called children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Do you see this, church? Even in hardship, even in poverty, even in suffering, even if we suffer loss here, we have so much to glory in, thanks to our Father in heaven. Amen? The flip side of this example James gives us is just as the material poor man should boast in his spiritual blessings, so should the materially rich man glory in his humiliation. So what is James saying here? He's saying that the person who seemingly has all the material wealth and health and all the blessings should rejoice or glory in trials when they come because they teach him that all of those material things are incapable and cannot provide inner and lasting satisfaction or help when those trials come, especially spiritually. James tells us that both, both this rich man and his possessions are like a flower of the grass that will pass away. Similarly to what James is saying here, Peter quotes Isaiah in 1 Peter 1.24. He says, for all flesh, all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls. James gives special attention to riches and wealth because it is far too easy for the world but also for believers and us to place their trust in material possessions. This can be very dangerous. So James continues as he adds, for the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. And so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. The loss of material wealth is meant to drive the rich man closer to God to grow in spiritual maturity, blessing, and the satisfaction only the Lord can provide. Richard Lenski, who's a pastor, scholar, also a commentator, says this, faith in Christ lifts the lowly brother beyond his trials to the great height of a position in the kingdom of Christ, whereas God's child, he is rich and may rejoice and boast. Faith in Christ does an equally blessed thing for the rich brother. It fills him with the spirit of Christ, the spirit of lowliness and true Christian humility. As the poor brother forgets all his earthly poverty, so the rich brother forgets all his earthly riches, and the two are equals by faith in Christ. That is what unites us. Our application, trials will bring all rich and poor alike to a place of ultimate dependency on God, revealing our need for humble submission to God to persevere through trials. How are we to persevere through these trials? Firstly, unwavering faith, found in God's wisdom. Secondly, we need a spirit of humility, that is, dependence, full dependence on God alone. And thirdly, we see God rewards those who stand the test out of their love for God. Look at verse 12 with me. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Amen. I mentioned earlier how the book of James parallels the Sermon on the Mount. And this opening line of verse 12 here is a perfect example. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, testing, or temptation. Makarios in the Greek, or blessed, is the same word translated for all of the Beatitudes at the beginning of Matthew 5. 
making this verse itself another beatitude. James is also echoing what we heard last week in verse 2, that we are to count suffering as joy. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. So what comes to your mind when you think of the word blessed? Is it happiness? Is it getting things you want or need? Is being blessed an attitude? I, uh, I lived in Florida um, for a time, and I would frequent an IHOP because I love pancakes. And I probably went too many times, but anyway. There was a waitress there, and any time someone would ask her how she was doing, it was like clockwork every single time. She'd say, oh honey, I am too blessed to be stressed. Every single time. I loved her enthusiasm. James is declaring here that a blessed man, being blessed, is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Because blessed is so much more than happiness or getting all you want. More than living a carefree life, free of conflict or hardship. It's rooted in a deep inner joy and satisfaction. It is a joy that only the Lord himself self, is able to give to those who for his sake and only in his power, faithfully, patiently, and humbly endure and conquer the difficulties they face. The Apostle Peter puts it this way, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1, 6-7. Our faith only grows stronger when tested by trials. Trusting God through our trials pushes us toward the Christ-like maturity of trusting God more and more deeply and with greater endurance. That choice to keep trusting God in the midst of trial brings his blessing. The one who perseveres under trial and never for one second stops trusting or relinquishing his trust in God is the true believer. For when he has stood the test with his faith intact, unwavering faith, he is approved by God and receives the crown of life eternal. And don't think a crown of royalty here. This isn't the king's crown. When this is translated, this crown is more of an athletic term, like the wreath the victorious Olympian would receive. So think persevering through the challenge and coming out the other side triumphant. That is the imagery here. For those of us challenged or facing struggle, God rewards us when we seek him in the fire of our battles. He calls us blessed when faced with pain and hardship as we throw ourselves on him. Depending on his strength, enduring to the end, he rewards us with the crown of life, the crown of eternal life and salvation. So more accurately, perseverance attests to God's approval, for it gives evidence of eternal life. It gives evidence of salvation. John MacArthur puts it this way to make it even clearer. Perseverance does not result in salvation and eternal life. Hear that, church. Perseverance does not result in salvation and eternal life, but is itself the result and evidence of salvation and eternal life. Perseverance is the mark of a true Christian. We persevere because we have Jesus. It's evidence to a watching world of the hope that is in us. It is by his strength and by his power we do these things. It is because we are saved and Christ is in us that we can endure and persevere. James ends verse 12 associating faithful perseverance under trial with genuine love for God. Perseverance being one of the surest evidences of those who love him. Is, isn't the, the definition of a genuine believer, isn't it the genuine love of God? John makes many connections of the love for God and genuine faith. In 1 John 4 he says, anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In 1 John 4.16 he says, so we have come to know and to believe 
the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. And in 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God, loved ones, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. A genuine Christian is not merely someone who at some point in life made a profession of faith in Christ, but a person who demonstrates true, unwavering faith by an ongoing love for God that cannot be shaken, nor can it be destroyed by troubles, suffering or hardships, no matter how severe or long-lasting. Love and obedience go hand in hand. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It is out of our love for Christ we obey, we obey him, not because of religious duty or obligation. There was a woman on social media who would engage with me time to time, mainly to do with fitness-related issues. But every so often, she would comment on posts I would make professing my faith or love for Jesus. At first, these remarks were subtle. She clearly was living for self, and there was a sense of offense when she would comment. This is just one of her comments, and I quote, the message of shame in the gospel message that people are sinful and are not good, these are the kind of toxic mindsets of Christianity. I'm just glad I woke up. She would go, on and on that she was a Christian, believe it or not. So at one point, she would hold Bible studies in her, in her house before she woke up. After some very lengthy conversations with her, I understood why she was so hostile towards me and God. She had a child that was born very sick and disabled. She got caught up in the prosperity gospel and made a profession of faith based on the idea that if she was a Christian, her son will be healed. One of the many evils of fa false gospels out there and why I hate them. She was expecting a hand up from God like he was some genie in a bottle. Like because she accepted Jesus, Jesus was now somehow obligated to heal her son. Well, church, he didn't, and her son died. And so did her profession of faith in the midst of her trials, in the midst of her suffering, she walked away. She turned her back on Christ. She believed a lie from some very deceived and lost people. Now, I explained to her that it's not that she just woke up and found some new form of enlightenment and that God is now not real because he didn't answer her, but that she was never truly a Christian to begin with. She didn't know the true living God who is worthy regardless of what we suffer. I shared the true gospel with her and I continue to every time I have the chance. But our application, genuine unwavering faith is incorruptible in the face of trials. And our love for God keeps us persevering in the face of those challenges no matter what. We are to ask our loving, amazing God for wisdom, loved ones. We are to seek to know him, his word, his truth, and his promises. And in doing so, he equips us to weather any storm, anything you face, anything you go through, any trial, any difficulty you face, he equips us. He rewards us with eternal life the crown of glory as we persevere through the fires that refine us and strengthen our faith in him for his glory and for his honor. How do you persevere through trials, Christian? Maybe you're going through some right now. You need unwavering faith found in God's wisdom, which he generously gives. A spirit of humility that is full and complete dependence on God alone. And it is knowing God rewards those who stand the test out of their genuine love for him. 
Let us all as a church be known for our perseverance, church, through trials to a watching world and be living testimonies to the hope that is alive in us, which is Christ. Bow with me in prayer. Father, we praise you. Oh God, you are so good. You command us to seek you, to ask you, Lord, for wisdom that you have so graciously given us in your living word. Father, I pray that we would humble ourselves, that we would not wait in our suffering, that we would not wait in our difficulties and our trials to come before you. You generously give your wisdom and understanding. May we ask you, may we fall before you. You are so good to us, Lord. Thank you so much, Jesus, for what you have done for us, that we can know you. Lord Jesus, that you even right now in this moment are interceding on our behalf. Lord, I pray for those that are here, if they are going through difficulties, or they, if they are suffering in any way, that they would come before you, that they would seek your wisdom, that you would grant them understanding, and that they could know you in a powerful way. Lord, we love you, and that is why we obey you, because you are good and you are just. We bring all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.